My name is Michael Guyad, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour are two phenomenal traders, speakers, very knowledgeable people, Linda Rashke and Mandy Rafsanjani. Mandy, uh, just quickly introduce yourself to the audience, and then we'll go to Linda and we'll get started. So, yes, um, I have been a professional coach for um, almost 20 years now, working with traders pretty much from the get-on and specialized now in performance and mindset coaching. The difference is mindset is all about, you know, our behaviors, our beliefs, our emotional responses, improvement. Performance coaching, um, I for myself classify as I look at my traders' behaviors in the markets, their statistical what we can see in the statistics, um, what does that tell me about their level of trading, how they interact with the market. So looking at, you know, what kind of profit factor they have or, you know, the number of losing and winning trades in a row, for example, that tells me a lot about their behavioral patterns that we can then bind into the emotional and mindset patterns and then look at and performance improvement plan from there. Perfect. And Linda, go ahead and introduce yourself as well. I've been in the markets for uh, 43 years. I started off on the exchange floors doing options arbitrage. And I've uh, morphed and done a little bit of everything, moved upstairs, traded futures, became a CTA, started a hedge fund. I retired about seven years ago, closed down my hedge fund, but I still trade every day for myself. So Linda, I'll, I'll start with you given how long you've been in the business and the level of interaction you've had with different traders, both new and experienced. Is it fair to say that new traders are perhaps more dangerous today than they were in the past? And I say that only because there's that old saying that sometimes a little bit of information can be very dangerous without context, understanding what drives you to the conclusion, right? And there's so much information now, I'd make the argument that uh, a little bit of information can be much worse today than it was years ago. Well, I think whether you were starting out 40 years ago, 20 years ago, or just a couple years ago, the issue of context is something that just takes time, time and experience to build, no matter you know what the environment is. I would say for sure today, it's easier with the electronic platforms to get in and out. That was not the case, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago when we didn't have, you know, the electronic trading and you had to actually pick up the phone and call down to the floor or a broker, you know, and uh, therefore you had to have a little bit more pause for thought and probably weren't trading with the same frequency that you can just bang away today if you want. So that would be a key difference. And then, of course, you're absolutely right. There's a wealth of stimulus out there on the internet, but of course, every individual has the option to control that. So somebody who's really focused on improving their performance is probably going to not engage in, you know, those types of social media things while you have, uh, while you're monitoring the markets. And that's probably true with any performance oriented discipline, you know, sports, music, you have to block out all those outside uh, distractions and just keep your own game board. Yeah. And, and Mandy, I think it's a, it's a good transition to you for a, a couple minutes here. The uh, I think we should define for the audience when you say performance mindset and coaching, what performance is, because I don't think performance is necessarily a return on your portfolio. Right? Performance is far more than just the size of your account. That's absolutely correct. So um, yeah, when I talk about performance, I look really at the statistics of their trading behavior. So you know we. We have so many software, softwares out now like TraderView, um, TraderSync that easily captures the behavioral patterns of the trading performance, meaning, you know, how many trades did you make? How many trades did you make in this particular instrument? How long did you stay in winning trades compared to in losing trades? The number of losing winning trades in a row, as I mentioned before, your biggest winner, your losing, um, biggest loser, your, profit factor per approach, right? So we have different trading strategies. Does one trading strategy perform better in this market than another strategy? So there's so much data that we can deduct from, from um, you know, with the help of these you know, softwares that help us to really drill down into where do we need to improve in the context of trading because, you know, Michael, a lot of traders come to me and they say, I have a mindset problem. And then we look at their trading statistics 
And then we can see that, you know what, your, your biggest losers are actually bigger than your biggest winners and your profit factor is below one. So that is not mindset, that is skill set. And um, it's like black and white. It's not what I'm saying. It's what the software is saying, what the statistics is saying. And numbers don't, don't lie, right? So that helps me as a coach to also help my trader to do a lot of self-coaching. Once they have learned how to look into the statistics of their performance, they don't need me anymore to do that. Like they can do that easily and see easily where they are lacking in their performance. So Linda, Peter Lynch is known for that saying that you have to know what you own. Is it about knowing what you own or knowing who you are? I, I think there's a really underappreciated aspect of the idea that it's more than just doing research on a stock. It's trying to self-evaluate yourself and how you respond to noise signal and the stimulus you just mentioned well there's no doubt that different people will do better with a different different types of styles and that's part of the initial learning curve that can take up at least to three years now i'm more of a uh, a, a shorter term trader as opposed to an investor or a macro positioner with stocks so let's just take the example of trading just basic trading you know there's actually trading with a system volatility breakout or trend following you can do seasonal trades you can do just discretionary day trading with the S&Ps you can you know follow uh, just short term swing trading based on technicals there's so many different styles and part of that's just going to depend on your temperament so in your investigative process during the first 3 to 4 years you know you want to stay on low leverage and eventually you know, it's like trying on different hats and then you'll find something that works for you and what works for me might not work for somebody else. And along those lines, Linda, do you think that new traders are not really understanding time frames properly? I mean, the term short term, you know, used to be months, now you know, it became weeks and now it's becoming intraday. You can even argue that weekly swing trading is by some is viewed as, as long term. I wonder how you think about defining time frames when it seems that across the board it's getting shorter and shorter for newer traders. You know honestly, I don't see what newer traders do, so I really can't speak to that. I will say that the intraday opportunity or what they would call the length of line based on the volatility, the ranges is 10 times what it used to be 20 years ago. So the bigger the length of line, that would be if you took all the wiggles and jiggles, the zigzags of intraday chart, and you straightened them out, the length of line is huge compared to what it was 20 years ago. So that implies that the intraday opportunity is so much greater, and, and that's also based on the volatility and in the increase in ranges. So you have to look at if you're holding a position, your standard deviation, just by staying with that, meaning the swings on the bottom line, are going to be bigger. And I find that newer traders have a low tolerance for taking a little heat or giving back profits, those types of things, which is inevitable if you are positioning, you know, to capture a bigger swing. So I'd just say that right now, the op there's been plenty of opportunity to trade on a shorter time horizon um, and do very well than there ever has been, you know, say in previous decades. You know, so and, and then part of it's going to depend on your individual risk profile, your, you know, tolerance for the noise, all, all sorts of other variables. If I may add to that, Michael, the lo looking at the shorter time frames in terms of a mindset perspective, you know, what I find with the newer traders, they often want an entry in an exit signal and they want to trade. What and I'm going to add a little bit about, you know, what I observe in Linda because so many people ask me about that and I think traders are interested in that. So when I look at Linda, Linda loves markets. And coincidentally, I saw a tweet from Brett Steinbarger saying that there's a difference between traders who love trading, they, they struggle and they have a lot of emotional pain versus traders who love markets because they love understanding how markets work, you know, the, the bigger picture context, not just the entry and the exit, but what works when 
in which context, why does it work here and not there? And they do a lot of research in understanding the differences. And so I see a big difference in the newer traders, especially, you know, with the YouTube generation and showing your trading on a 15 second chart and making thousands of dollars may it be true or not, doesn't matter, but it doesn't work for every trader. And so I'm, I was working with a trader who trades on a one minute chart badly because he's a big picture guy. Like, you know, he ran a company with, um, I, I think 500 people. So you can imagine someone who's a CEO of that kind of company, a successful company, if I may add, and he saw the company went into trading. You don't have the detailed attention for a one minute chart naturally. Yes, you can train it, but he would do much better on a big picture. So, you know, swing trading, for example. But for swing trading, you need to understand more of context. And that was the part that was missing for him. And once we understood that, like he could then go and, and fill in this gap really easily. But for himself, he couldn't figure out, you know, what what it was, why he just could not perform when he was so successful in other areas of life. What I also see in the newer traders, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but so many traders come to me and say, I ask them, so what do you think is missing for you that would help you to improve your trading? And many respond, I want more confidence. And so what's confidence to you, right? Because again, confidence for some person means something different to another person. And the most common answer is a feeling, right? I want to feel better about my ability to trade. But feelings don't change trading. So what they're really seeking is self-efficacy. And this is the belief that you have the capacity to learn and that you can improve and that you can succeed eventually if you do what needs to be done. And this is something that I see Linda has, right? So Linda has um, self-efficacy. Linda did this, what was it, the Wexler, uh, what was it, Linda, Wexler test? Yeah, the, the one that you did with Brett Steinberger and... Actually, yeah, we I ran a study to see what, this was with Brett Steinberger and Andrew Lowe at MIT many, many years ago, ran a study based on 60 traders trying to discern if there was a particular personality trait or style that the professional traders with longevity had that could distinguish them between like retail newer traders with lower success rates. That's the one. And where you came out with um, future focused and a little bit present. That was actually a different profile test. Okay, so I'll explain the difference between the two of these because both yes. of these are interesting. And the sum results of the Andrew Lowe study was that we really couldn't discern any individual traits because by sheer factor that a trader had been trading for 20, 25 years, you build a thick skin and you're less emotional and reactive. Okay. And, you know, you've been desensitized to everything, but when you're new and just starting out, even if it's been two or three years, you're still in that, you know, a little bit of emotional, reactive sensitivity, adrenaline rush. And, you know, it's just over time you build a thick skin. So it was really hard to draw a conclusion because of the survivorship bias. The other thing is a profile, sort of like a personality type of profile, but like given your innate tendencies, where you're ranked by your future, past, present, and create are the buckets, the four buckets. And everybody has a dominant factor of one of those and a recessive one. And so, for example, if you excel in create, that's a dominant factor. Those people do very well working with their hands, building cabinets, being creative, visualizing things. If you are dominant in the past, that means that you love research and statistics. You'd make a great researcher, scientist, librarian. You know, if you're dominant in future, that means that absolutely you'd be uh, good at trading, you know, looking forward, not back, not getting hung up on the past. And, uh, you know, you like that possibilities. So, there are all, all kinds of little subtle things that are just fun to look at in this business. Yeah. And so this is really interesting because someone who is past oriented, they're usually the ones who have a lot of regret and pain about the mistakes they made in the past. And they find it hard to move on and, and you know, look for the next trade and do better on that next trade. So what we can observe in Linda, and I don't know if you have read Linda's book, Trading Sardines, which is a wonderful collection of all the challenges 
in her trading, in her life and how she overcame them. So when we look at Linda, Linda makes a mistake. And then, you know, there's a moment of, you know, dang, and, you know, made this mistake. And then a minute later, it's like, no, she focuses on the future and buckles down, refocuses and does better because there was this trade, the botched bean trade in the book and where Linda had a big drawdown because there was a big gap over the weekend. There's nothing you can do, right? That's the stuff that happens in trading, Michael. You know all about that as well. And there was a massive drawdown in the account. And so Linda just cuts, right? She doesn't try to get out at the better price. She just gets out. Then she refocuses. She looks at, okay, so what happened? And then she repositions. And Linda writes in the book that, okay, so if I make every day, I don't know, something insane to me, like $200,000 a day, then I make up for that loss. And at the end of the month, she came out better because, you know, running a fund, you have a responsibility towards your clients, right? And so Linda was very responsible, wanted to come out the end better to for her clients. And she did. So only a person who's future oriented can do that. A person that's past oriented, they're too much hurting and then they go on tilt, then they go on revenge trading, trying to make the money back, not from a possibility viewpoint, but from a, I need to fix this viewpoint. Very, very different, right? So if you are someone who is a past oriented person, don't worry, you're not doomed you can actually go and train yourself to be future oriented. Right? And that's what I love about my work. I look at how does someone naturally think and interact with the world and behave. And then we can look at what is that we need to train and, and do better. Now, can everybody be like Linda and trade like Linda? I don't think everybody can because that future oriented is innate. But we can all become prof uh, profitable traders because we can train ourselves to a certain level. So that's that's what I believe and also have seen in my clients. By the way, I've made that point on podcasts myself. It's like when you see all these authors, all these books about you know investing like Warren Buffett, how to how to trade like uh, Stanley Druckenmiller. It's al it's always to me like this is this is kind of silly, right? Because uh, you don't have the same biological makeup, you don't respond to risk the same way. How could you possibly? mimic somebody's investment style when it's a totally different physiological makeup. Exactly. So what you want to do is you want to look at how do they think, how do they react in certain situations, and then learn that and not do what they do, what the majority of new traders want to do. They want to trade like someone instead of thinking like someone learning how to think. Linda, there's a, uh, this is going to sound like a strange direction to go, but I think it's it's maybe kind of interesting to tease out. There have been some really interesting studies that would argue that the traits of successful CEOs tend to match up to the traits you would see in psychopaths from a psychology perspective, right? They tend to be ruthless, driven. They don't let the past get them down. They're They're confident, largely overconfident. I wonder if you think there's some elements of being a psychopath when it comes to being a successful longer term trader, because let's face it, 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 it sounds kind of crazy if you're going through a big drawdown to have confidence that you'll be able to come back. I don't believe that. And I don't like generalizations like that. You know, oh, CEOs are, you know, have characteristics of psychopaths because I've just seen so many different personality traits and profiles. You certain, certainly wouldn't say that about somebody like Paul Tudor Jones, you know, so I think that does the business a disservice. You know, there's been different environments. People come from different backgrounds. Uh, the, the, you know, if you're a very large institution or fund, you have to be on a longer time horizon, more of a macro type of approach, just because you can't move that type of money on shorter timing, unless, of course, you're a fund like Renaissance Medallion and you have a, 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 is an insanely sophisticated infrastructure that allows you to make millions of short-term trades 24-7 around the globe, right? And the, and the average holding time for the Renaissance Medallion Fund trade was less than 24 hours. So, you know, and that was probably the most successful fund in the world. You do not have to be on a long time horizon. You know, they're just different games. I, I would never be able to play the type of game that was so dependent on having this amazing infrastructure and computing power. You know, Ray Dalio has 100 percent 
quantified all his models, there is no human decision making involved in that. Yet he's considered to be uh, very successful, you know, and does have quite explicit macro views. So there's just so many variations on everything. I'll give you a little example because I've thought about this when Mandy was mentioning how initially newer traders like well-defined entries and exits, which is a very linear type of thinking. Nothing wrong with that because you have to have a departure point to start off with. That's how we start to build experience. You know, if I said, here's a little bull flag on a five minute chart, enter, hold it 10 minutes, get out. That's a start. And from there you start to gain experience and see nuances and so forth. But in terms of these well-defined show me a five minute or an hourly chart and the player, the pattern. I like playing bridge. Um, I haven't played much lately, but a deck of cards and bridge is 52 cards. That's it. It's considered to be a closed system where you don't have outside variables that come into play. The market is a dynamic system where you always have new information, new variables coming into play. So if we just take the example of bridge, a closed system, there's 635 billion bridge hands possible. Okay, so imagine in the markets now trying to say how many different ways something could play out. It's infinite. The market never repeats itself the same way exactly. So therefore, yes, we can have these linear crutches if you want a bar chart to, you know, uh, manage your risk. That's probably the most important thing is defining the support and and, uh, resistance levels so you can manage your risk. But I think that's something that people neglect with the technical analysis. That's its whole point with technical analysis is to manage your risk. But in terms of building that conceptual model, I think that's why so many short-term traders have had a huge difference in their trading when they've been introduced to market profile, because this is more of a non-linear type of display of information. And there is more types of days, you know, where you can put things into a a bucket, you know, there's maybe eight basic types of days. So even though we have trillions of possibilities and combinations out there, we can put them into these buckets. And then that allows you to sort of visualize free of a three or a 15 or a 60 minute uh, time chart. And we can concentrate on more the way the market is trading. So you can take that type of thinking Okay, this conceptual type of thinking. And then you can expand that if you are more of a macro type of longer term time frame institutional player looking at metrics, be it cash on the sidelines, sentiment or seasonality or presidential cycles or, you know, relative strength type of work. But you still have to have some type of structure or model by which to base your thinking. You can't just say, I have a macro view that this banking crisis is going to take the market down. You know, you have to go beyond that and uh, look for other supportive variables, you know, uh, credit markets and, and goodness knows there's a zillion factors out there that you can assess. You can't just have an opinion being macro. And that's unfortunately a big trap that I see a lot of players fall into is it, it's effectively based on news, not necessarily looking at the monetary environment out there, which is the main driver, okay? We just have to wrap it in this little fundamental couch. So I know I got a little bit wordy there. You know, my main point was, first of all, that the number of possibilities is infinite from day to day with the market. So of course, nobody can trade like Buffett or whoever, but you can approach that style of value investing or a trend following relative strength approach. So these are styles. And and that's something that even if you're a short-term trader or a very long-term institutional type of client, you have to specialize in a particular style. And then that's what you're selling to your client base. So I, I actually love this this point and this direction. And, and Mandy, I want to go to you on this. The um, You're hitting on this very point I keep referencing that as you correctly said, it's not a closed system. Probabilities change second by second because, to your point, Linda, there's always new variables. And the problem that I see with a lot of you traders, and I get it in insults and comments to my own tweets, <laughs> is people say, well, it sounds like you're flip-flopping. And yeah. I always go back to that's what you're supposed to do because conditions change, probabilities change, and you have to adapt. 
to what's going on in the here and now. Mandy, I have to assume that when you talk about it from a mindset performance coaching standpoint, getting somebody to realize they can't be married to a single view is probably among the bigger challenges newer traders have. Well, Michael, you know, I always say you can be married to a single view, but um, ask anyone who got a divorce, that's very expensive, right? Financially and emotionally. So if it rocks your boat, go ahead. <laughs> and, and but, but, but that was, that was, probably, that was not the first folks. That was phenomenal. That response. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So, um, but what you're talking about, Michael, is behavioral flexibility. And in Australia, in Melbourne, we have an amazing part of our university. It's called the mind body. I can't remember something decision making lab. And they actually study how we make financial decisions to have an MRI scan and uh, it's just phenomenal. And, and I really love these guys. Um, you know, I had coffee with a professor, lucky enough. Um, he spent like five hours with me talking very, very generous with his time and knowledge. And so there was just a recent research that they, that they put out. And the research is that there is a um, similarity between and people who have OCD and compulsive gamblers. And the similarity is that they have a low behavioral flexibility, low to none, meaning that there is a cue, right? There's a trigger, something creates an emotion or a thought. They only have one way of responding to it. And the um, that's in a nutshell, right? And very simplified. So what we can conclude for that from that is when we help people who are gamblers and have OCD and other addictions, if we help them, that's my job as a coach, to have more choices, to say, you know what, just because you're hungry to use, you know, the example of an Oreo, I remember your Oreo tweet, I really have a want to have an Oreo, you know, it was a really big day and I'm feeling exhausted, but I also don't want to ruin my health. And so for many, it's like, I want this, you know, chocolate and I have this strong urge and um, craving for the chocolate. Now, if I only have one way of responding, I give in. But if I have many ways of responding, behavioral flexibility, so to speak, I can say, do I really want this chocolate? Because I want to be healthy, right? Or I want to be fit, or I want to fit into my dress uh, neck for tomorrow's charity function that you know Linda and I are going to. So that is a behavioral flexibility. And when you see someone who responds to your tweets with um, your flip flopping, you can imagine how the rest of their lives go because they don't understand the concept. And that exactly um, leads into what Linda said. Markets are not linear. Markets are um, behaving in all kinds of wondrous ways. And we need to adapt to that. No one would say you're crazy and flip-flopping when you're surfing out and there's new waves coming. You change the waves, right? Everyone would say, yeah, of course you do. <laughs> but it just shows that a lot. It, it shows why 90% of traders, if it is not even more, are not performing well. Because what they're missing is something called... Um, so it's something about the five um, levels of intelligence, uh, fluid reasoning, it's called. It's the capacity to think logically and to solve problems in novel situations. I'm reading, obviously, the definition, independent of acquired knowledge. And that was from Cattell, 1987. And fluid reasoning, we all have heard about it, right? It's like you have um, 50 different fruits in the basket. You have um, three times as many apples as oranges, but only half as many lemons as oranges. How many oranges are in the basket? That is how you can practice fruit reasoning. And when you look at prop firms and hedge funds, they use these kind of tests to identify if the trader has potential, uh, if the person has a potential to be a good trader, because what they have is problem solving and they can think logically, they can think rationally, they can think in consequences. So if I don't take my loss right now, what is the consequence of that? And when I work with traders who are seasoned traders who come to me because they want to improve or because they're going through divorce or some other challenges, they have this kind of thinking. Right? They don't think about, I don't want to lose that money. I don't want to lose $100. They think about, I need to protect my capital. The market environment has changed. So now I close, I take that loss, I reposition, 
what do I need to do now? And then they're very, very fluid in changing their approach because that's what the markets require and that's what we love them for. Just to reset the room for the remaining minutes, first of all, everybody, please make sure you follow Mandy Rafsanjani, Linda Rashke. Again, this will be in all your favorite platforms under that lead lag live banner. Please, folks, do me a favor, rate, review that, and share these spaces as they're live, given that I do this as a solo effort. Again, my name is Michael Gayad uh, as the host here. So, Linda, I think everything that Mandy just said dovetails actually to the original title, which is macro is not trading, because the end result of being unable to flip-flop is being very invested in a story, in a narrative. And macro is very good for that. The, the problem that I've always had with all these macro thinkers that have large followings is all that they're saying could end up being right. But when you're managing a portfolio, it's not about the endpoint. It's about the dance in between the endpoints. It's about the sequence, not what un- ends up ultimately happening, right? For you, as somebody who's done this for a while, Linda, how do you keep yourself centered on that point? It's uh, There's so much... There's so much out there that can cause anybody to have and pontificate on an opinion, as you kind of alluded to earlier, and it's really easy to do so, and it becomes, I think, problematic to to fight those urges. I find that any time I start to deviate towards having an opinion or a bias like that, because you know that is one of the challenges I think for um, trading, be it short term or long time horizon, is that people build in cognitive biases, whether they realize it or not. And that's why you can have two macro players, you know, both with the same size funds, both with similar time horizons. One can be a bull, one can be a bear. Okay, so, you know, there's no right or wrong. It's uh, back to the shorter term stuff. First of all, as a technical trader, I recognize that my duration for being able to forecast with having an edge is short. Okay, I cannot predict what's going to happen six months from now. It's beyond my control. And there could be too many things that change in the meantime. You know, look, we have Russian invasion, you know, a zillion different things that can unfold. So I have to remind myself I'm on a shorter time horizon because that's what I can control in my sphere of technicals. And so therefore, uh, anytime I do feel like I'm starting to build a bias, I try to revert back to my models and everything is a is a game of statistics, seriously. And so it doesn't matter the entry or the exit. There's still a, a window. OK, there's a window. And that's how you have to think about your trade. If I enter on the close and I exit on the close two days later, will I have a positive expectation? If I buy on the morning and sell on the close, will I have a positive expectation? It's not a matter of like, are my entries and exits perfect? It's like an actuarial table. Does that make sense? Yeah, Yeah, you can apply that thinking, that actuarial table type of thinking. That's what seasonals are. They're just actuarial tables. You can really apply that to a multitude of uh, different things, you know, presidential cycles, seasonals, you know, just short term technical biases and um, and see if there's an edge. So that always that's what brings me back and centers me and, you know, eliminates the noise. It really comes down to just the statistics and probabilities. How should that day be traded? I start from there and each day can be traded a different way. Perhaps today is a low to high day. Perhaps today is a rotational consolidation day. And if I just take it like that in little bite-sized pieces, that eliminates all the biases because one day you could be trading from the long side. The next day there could be a breakout type of pattern. The next day you could be trading from the short side. And that's what that Taylor trading technique book is all about. And that influenced me a lot. So, and then same thing with this uh, little workshop that Mandy and I are doing tomorrow. I'm, I'm speaking specifically on trend days. Okay. So trend days have the best risk reward profile of all types of days, but the frequency of occurrence is on the low side. So we find that imbalance in all different types of styles, be it, you know, trend following or a macro or or the short term technicals, that sometimes the things with the highest or the best, most favorable risk reward don't happen that often. And that's what people struggle against. Those moments where the deck is loaded and everything's ripe, you know, they just don't happen that often. You know, as a trader, you want to hope 
that they happen more frequently. You want to hope that those sentiment readings are at such extremes and that weekly chart structures and ABC down or whatever the case may be, and it affords us an opportunity to initiate a lot of positions with a long side bias. You might only get that spot once or twice a year to do that type of trade. Does that make sense? Yeah, and relate that to your own trading the last, you know, two, three weeks. Uh, I keep, I but I was fairly, I think, consistent in my concern that March would be volatile. And as this, in quotes, crisis was unfolding, saying that this is not the credit event that I think is still kind of coming down the pipeline here. And you end up having people on Twitter, I was joking, spending 92 hours in a single day, just basically pontificating about the end of the financial system. That's 2008 all over again. I'm curious, just, you know, in terms of what you yourself did or how you responded to the last several weeks. How do you well, trade again, this? the trading opportunity has been fabulously lucrative because of the ranges and the volatility. So if I continue to do my approach one day at a time, you know, today is a trend day. The next day is a consolidation day. Now it's a sell short day, according to my little algorithms and pattern recognition. It's fabulous. But on the other hand, I, I did two tweets maybe two, three weeks ago pointing out the equilibrium point that had formed in both the S&Ps and the NASDAQ on the weeklies. So if you were to pull up a weekly chart, you'll see that we are exactly in the middle of a big time, you know, one year long sideways trading line. And it's, uh, you know, starting to wind down with shorter weekly swings on either side. And what happens is that when the market approaches this type of equilibrium point, and as an aside, the NASDAQ is, is trying to get something going to the upside here out of that point, but the data becomes increasingly noisy. Everybody wants to try and jump on board that next trend at these data points, you know, a trend down or a trend up. So the opinions get even more exaggerated. So on the short time frame, as the market's doing this testing and is it going to break out? Is it going to have false breakouts? This type of process, which it usually does several times before a real trend unfolds, you know, as an opportunistic trader, which is what I like to do, it's it's great opportunity. I don't know if if we'll uh, you know come out the downside or the upside. I mean, my technicals are a little bit more biased to the long side just because of the leadership and the tech and and uh, you know just some things like that. But it's not a broad based rally right now. You know that's a, that's problematic. You know the small caps are struggling. I'm sure that's a little bit because of the banking and financials. You know, but I also look at the sentiment readings, which tell me that there is possibly a lot of cash on the sidelines just because they are overly weighted to the bearish side. But those are not the basis of a trade for me. I just have them in my back pocket, you know? So I'm like everybody else, okay, how am I going to trade today? I, I came in uh, thinking it was going to be a low to high day because some of my models, like on the NASDAQ and these types of stocks have, what you know, pinball buys, a little kitschy, uh, you know, quantifiable thing. And, and yesterday smelled like a long liquidation flush simply because it came on news. See, so the way a market moves you know, if it's based on news, sometimes the strongest trends happen when nobody can figure out why. So I don't want to play a guessing game as to why or how the market's going to eventually break out to the upside or to the downside. And you have to consider that sideways on these weekly charts is also a form of trend. I've seen markets consolidate sideways for months, you know, some markets like the yen or, uh, you know, have notorious history of doing this. So I, I, again, it would keep me from trading if I took away my flexibility by having, uh, you know, a longer term opinion there. Yeah, by the way, that point on the why I think is really important. And Mandy, I want to go to you on this, because this is what I mm -hmm. often see also on FinTwit, which is that everybody always wants to have the why. And that's the catalyst. And that's why markets are going to go up or go down. And there are studies on this. It's not debatable. You look at some of, the, some of the biggest up days and biggest down days for the market. Most of the time, there's no real headline that explains it because there's always a degree of randomness and noise, and that randomness and noise can be consequential in the very short term. Going into the psychology behavioral part, Mandy, you mm -hmm. know, the, the human mind always wants a narrative, always wants a story, always wants a clean reason for why things happen the way they happen. Presumably part of what you're doing in this performance coaching and mindset is getting people comfortable with randomness, with uncertainty. Yes. 
if that's the case, how do you, how do, you do that? Because that's um, that's a very difficult thing to do when we are hardwired to find a reason. It goes back to behavioral flexibility, doesn't it? So they have one way of thinking, linear thinking, as Linda calls it. And, um, and I see that with most new traders and with every struggling traders. And again, you know, everybody's asking, like, what's the difference between successful traders and losing or struggling traders? And you know, they come up with, with things like um, grit and resilience and confidence. No, it's, um, it's the ability to think, right? To, to see the bigger picture. So when you just listen to Linda, there was nothing about how she feels about the market. Everything was about the models that she investigated, the understanding of um, is there money on the sidelines? So everything is focused on the subject matter and not about her. And this is what a lot of traders miss, but they don't know that, right? So what I found is they make it about them how they feel, how they don't want to feel, their fears, their upbringing. Yes, it has an impact, and I work on that as well. But there is so much, and I blame the trading psychology field for that because it's emerged in the last you know, few years. It's become so popular that it's actually lost its purpose. I think um, too many traders think that they have a mindset problem, and it's really they don't know how to think and how to get information and how to become proficient at the skill. So I see that they don't have behavioral flexibility. I teach them how to add more choices by you don't understand the difference between a retracement, which arguably yesterday could have been a retracement after FOMC, and then it continues to the upside. I don't know what it's been doing in the last hour, but it continues this morning, or a reversal. And I saw a lot of traders on Twitter who are you know, calling for the next low, we don't know that as yet, right? We know there is a possibility of a low if today, if yesterday's low has been taken out. But as long as that's not taken out, like, you know, we are still, bars are still opening higher and closing higher in a big picture. So that is what I teach them. I teach them to maybe have a little less self-focus and navel gazing. Yes, that's important, but to focus on improving their skill set, understanding what really moves markets and get away from these YouTube teachings and, and more like someone like Linda who understands how all the moving parts interact with each other and not just looking at, you know, there's a bearish engulfing or there's a um, head and shoulders set up because if they work on it, depends on the context again, right? So there's um, traders that I see on Twitter, they are very macro-oriented ex-fund traders, and they have this big macro view that, you know, the world is screwed and the market has to <laughs> has to collapse, and they keep shorting and shorting and shorting. And I wonder how deep their pockets are or how big their positions are because they've been shorting since, you know, since the low in December almost, and yeah. Don't know how they survive. By the way, on that point, it's like because I, I, people will always come back and say, you know, markets can remain irrational longer than you can stay exactly. solvent. And my response is, my response is only if you're short, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, no, no. And it's actually that's actually very mechanical, right? It's purposely because you can you can bet on the end of the world by not shorting. You can bet <laughs> on the on the on the end of the world by assets that benefit from the end of the world, like gold, like treasuries. And even if you're wrong in the trade, you still have a chance at compounding. Whereas if you're wrong on a trade on shorting, you're done. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is this kind of more of a side note. By the way, Linda, I do think if you if you want to ever compete against the YouTube influencers on that side, get a nice Lamborghini, take a picture <laughs> of yourself with the Lamborghini, okay, and show off how you're making so much return because that's what people gravitate towards. It's always about the get rich quick nonsense, and it ends up being long term very very uh, uh, painful. I have zero interest. I don't I don't sell products. I don't I don't want to be in that space. I I. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm very happy just living under a little bit of a rock and, you know, enjoying quality of life because I, uh, you know, who, who knows how many good, good years we have left. And so the quality of life for me gets compromised when you're doing the marketing and, and all these other things. And I, I'm just too old for that anyway. I uh, I can relate to that. Uh, believe me, I have to do it for my business, but I, I feel that that struggle. Okay. So, so let's talk for a minute here, Linda, on sort of um, the steepness of a learning curve. Presumably it's like everything else. I'm a big fan of sort of the Malcolm Gladwell of approaching 
anything, everything. It takes 10,000 hours, right, to really get to be an expert in something. But the problem, going back to this point about randomness when it comes to trading, investing markets, is that there is an aspect of diminishing returns, right? It's not like the harder you work, the more uh, you're going to perform better. Or the more you read some some uh, balance sheet, the more nuance you get into the line by line part of it, that you're going to have better returns. There's some point where it doesn't really add very much because the randomness is a bigger component. For you in your trading career, I'm curious, Linda, at, at what point did you say to yourself, you know what, I know everything that I'm going to need to know, and I'm going to stop self-studying and just, you know, except what the market gives me. Never, <laughs> never. You know, I, I, I love research and modeling and delving into the time series data. I mean, and I can always find something new or something tweaky or a different way of framing things out. You know, it's not the diminishing returns. That's not the point. It's like you find one thing that is, that you can a style or approach you can do consistently well, and then it's all about scalability. So that's where the real money's made. It's not that you're going to learn any new trick. Maybe you only need one trick and you can apply it consistently and it's scalable. That That's really where the, you know, the gold is buried. If I may add to that. So for example, I was working with a fixed income guy, a phenomenal trader, you know, N50, so long, long sustainable career. And, you know, when the interest environment, interest rate environment was low, he could not perform anymore because it was, it's like trying to surf when there is no wind, right? Then there's no waves. And so he tried to, he contacted me because he needed to reinvent himself, right? There was just nothing happening. And so what we could do is we could take the context. Uh, uh, so the same way he approached how he learned trading fixed income, we could then look at how can he apply that into other markets. And um, so I didn't change his trading strategy at all. I just helped him understand how he thinks, understand himself, what his strengths are in his, what made him so successful in this environment, and then apply that to markets that actually moved. Now, thank God, um, fixed income started to move just, I think, last year, and he had his best year ever, which then also gave him feedback that, yeah, maybe there are a few years when, you know, there's just no wind and nothing happens, but then, you know, maybe go and enjoy your life and and sit it out because, um, you know, those times will come back again. And I would also love to add to what you said before in terms of being short and going long. So I was working with a hedge fund manager over in, in, in Geneva and he has on his charts, he's like a huge spreadsheet with all his stats, right? And he has on top of his statistics since 1928, 90 times stocks fell at least 10% in 11 months and 41 times stocks fell at least 15% two years. So he keeps on top of mind the big picture of how markets perform so that he doesn't get caught up in the you know, in the excitement of fast moving markets. So that's how he managed himself because he's a very impulsive guy and he loves the challenge. He loves risk. And we needed to help him to kind of, you know, hold himself a little back, like, a, you know, like an over eager uh, racehorse. <laughs> I, I have to assume that, by the way, that you're more likely to have clients that have impulsive traits that are focused on stocks and bonds or even maybe even focused against commodities, right? I mean, presumably part of that. Yeah. Part of the decision, the question of personality traits and assessing likelihood of improving performance has to do with the asset class they're gravitating towards. Exactly. Linda, um, for the audience, uh, you know, you, you and Mandy are doing these workshops. Um, first of all, what's the what's the reason to do it? I mean, you've obviously had a very successful career. Some people would probably want to just say, you know what, why should I bother teaching others? I can just keep doing what I'm doing. There's effort involved. There's also excitement involved, but uh, talk through to the audience first of all what you and Mandy are are doing with these workshops and why even do it. What's your what's your motivation? First of all, it's singular. It's just one workshop. It's a one time deal. <laughs> it started off as a joke. I'm like, hey, we can do a you know a day here and it'll pay for your trading and your airfare over here because you know it's like a lot of money to fly from Australia and everything else. And you know our assistant is wonderful and he's getting buried, so we thought, well, we can get a little wedding present for him together. So it was kind of a spontaneous one-time thing. It's just one workshop. We did something as well. Uh, Mandy came over when I was living up in Illinois. I'm down full-time in Palm Beach now, but uh, it was up in Illinois. And she ended up coming out for a month. It was her first time over to the States. 
And so uh, I didn't realize she was going to be coming out for that long. And then she told me her tickets that she had booked. I'm like, oh, how interesting. I said, well, maybe maybe we can do something together. And it was, you know, her combining her expertise and, and mine, you know, with myself. And it was right as, oh, gosh, it was so crazy because it was right as the COVID stuff, the shit was hitting the fan. And it, the market was just falling out of bed during the month of March, you know. But I thought, well, I'll show my trades and, and Mandy can do the analysis. And, and she did individual profiles for people. So it was very insightful for me to see her learning process and her, um, you know, her, her approach in working with people, because I uh, really haven't had any experience with the psychology and the coaching and all this type of stuff. I've really been in an isolated little thing. So it's been awesome because it, it's given us an opportunity this whole last week just to, you know, bounce ideas off of back and forth off of each other. And so I think it's always important to have a, you know, a colleague or, a you know, another party that you can share back and forth. So we've been going nonstop for the last week. I had this wonderful lady. I, I, I compete horses and I have, um, there was this lady that came to our barn, Laura King, and had given this uh, talk right before Mandy came. And uh, she works with all the top Olympians in the town that I'm in and also has coached hedge fund managers, all kinds of people. But in this particular case, she was giving a talk to uh, 10 ladies at our barn. And, you know, it, it was all on the, the self-talk and performance and things that could be applied to any field or discipline and so forth. So first thing when Mandy came out here is we we perused her material together and digested, okay, what's pertinent here for the trading field? What's not? Have you heard of this theory? Blah, blah, blah. So it's just a very enriching exchange for, for both of us. And this just gives us a chance to do that in a more formalized structure. Yeah. And it was so much fun because then I could show Linda when I do the work with my traders, like this is what they're saying to themselves, right? This is how they talk themselves out of a trade or how they talk themselves into hanging on to a losing trade. And then looking at Laura King's material and how that fits into how riders do it, how tennis players do it. And so then getting Linda's perspective on what would you do in that situation? And, you know, Linda always says, I cut my losses straight away. I don't want this negative energy hanging around me. Yay. Why would I keep a loss? Right. It's like completely different mindset. And then we can teach that to traders who are hanging on to a loss, where someone like Linda, she cuts straight away. She doesn't want negative energy. And here we have now given someone behavioral flexibility, a different way of looking at a loss rather than I don't want to lose that amount of money to, or I don't want that negative energy, that negativity hanging around because I know then tomorrow I can't perform well. And you should see Linda's library, like the books in terms of you know, how to improve stress management, discipline, how to deal with failure, how the brain works, how your body works, you know, in terms of Linda living so healthy and, you know, um, how to bio, I hate the word biohack, but I don't have a better word now, how to improve your whole body by eating healthy, doing exercise, swimming. Like it's not just that Linda is an amazing trader because she knows how to read the markets. She does everything to support her performance, to bring out the best in her. And that's, it's just been such a pleasure and a privilege to, to observe that and to learn from Linda, so I'm very, very grateful. And I think uh, I'm going to make the assumption that on that bookshelf is not a single tweet. FinTwit is not how you learn about markets. It comes from hard work, reading, studying, having humility, knowing yourself. I think that's a, a truism, Linda. You know, it doesn't matter if you go to a conference or a workshop and hear somebody, if you see something on Twitter, if you uh, read about it, if you listen to a podcast, it's all good because there might be a gem of information there somewhere. It's more what you do with that. So if you're intrigued by somebody posting a chart, perhaps showing market profile dynamics on Twitter, it's going to serve you best if you then go and investigate 
Now, what was this person looking at? How do they see that? Can I see that same thing? Can I see it in a different market? You see, so it's more, uh, yeah, you don't care if people are bulls or bears or that type of noise and all the data and statistics isn't going to serve you. But I'm sure there's people out there who have, who might post a, you know, an interesting technical chart, a way of looking at something that gives you an idea then perhaps how to uh, come up with a different way of uh, quantifying a momentum indicator or whatever the case might be. So, you know, in the old days when I was starting off, I was on the trading floor. So I had a wealth of information just from seeing what other traders were looking at and reading and studying. Most of them were very short-term oriented, flipping paper in the pits, you know, and this is again, the options markets. So it was more strategic. It wasn't like being in the middle of the S&P pit and just having, you know, a two second holding period. It was, um, you always had positions on and you were always uh, trying to strategize with them. And so I think those people tended to be a little bit more technical. And then when I left the floor, the main resource, we didn't have the internet or anything like that, but there were uh, newsletters like Bo, I think he did this Club 3000 newsletter where they would uh, look at different systems. And this is sort of around the days of Larry Williams. And Larry Williams was hugely influential, you know, on the systematic approach. You know, if I did range expansion off of the day's opening and then exited the next day, you know, what is what are the statistics? And this type of thinking, it's along the lines of how Toby Craybell went about developing some of his early work and uh, lots of people. So, you know, we had the opportunity to do that type of research ourselves. And I think, I think that's where it was that type of thinking. So nowadays there's not the, uh, you know, the same type of conferences where you can go and hear necessarily people that are there in the interest of uh, showing their work, but not selling. So nowadays you do have a lot of online, uh, things that people can't attend. And you just have to be a little careful because most of them people have, you know, some interest of selling something. And that's really what you want to stay away from. If it was so good that they could sell it, you know, they would be using it themselves or, uh, you know, <laughs> a fund would be using it or something like that. But it doesn't mean it's bad. All you need is one kernel of an idea that you can then take and expand upon yourself. And that's where people need to go to the next step. Just don't follow somebody. They could have gotten out of the bed on the wrong side or be going through a divorce, as Mandy said, and be totally wrong. I saw that all the time. It's like any time you had a big trader on the floor going for a, going through a divorce, I mean, guaranteed they were going to drop seven digits, you know, but it doesn't mean that you can't take an idea and then expand on that with your own research. So it's, it's all good. You know, it's just, a again, moderation. You want to be careful that it doesn't become an addiction like your 13 year old teenager daughter on Instagram. Two things real quick and then we'll wrap up. I'll say uh, you, you basically reaffirm the idea that the market takes half just, just like a divorce. But then the other part of this is uh, it relates very much to the sort of line I keep saying on Twitter, uh, which I really do believe is something to keep in mind for not just markets, but life. Amateurs look to the right of the equal sign. Pros look to the left. You have to identify what goes into a conclusion, no matter what, who is saying the conclusion. You have to actually look to the left of the equal sign to see if it's based on something that's real or if it's based on randomness, which I think is you know, just another way of kind of summarizing what you just said, Linda. So with all that said, again, everybody, please make sure you follow Linda Rashke, Mandy, Rafson, Johnny. Show support to them. Uh, check out Treating Sardines uh, on Amazon if you're interested in Linda's. Great no, it's there. not on Amazon. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's not. I saw it there. It's only available on my website. And honestly, I, I, ah, think okay, I only better. have a couple hundred copies left. So I have to figure out what the heck I'm going to do when they're gone. That just means you you have the analog scarcity, the digital scarcity people always uh, refer to. Uh, everybody uh, should go to Linda's <laughs> website then and uh, get trading sardines from her uh, directly. So thank That's you, everybody, fun. for joining. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Linda. Appreciate it. <laughs>